Britain TV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct. Hello and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. And from the entire NTV Wild Talk crew, that includes the team at Wildlife Direct, our partners, and KWS, also our partners, and the team right here at NTV, we wish you a very happy new year. May 2017 be brilliant. Now, if you remember last week on the show, we brought you the best of some of the NTV Wild Talk shows in 2016. And since there were just so many amazing shows that we captured during the year, we thought we'd bring you part two of the best of. Now, NTV Wild Talk launched at the beginning of February 2016. The journey has been amazing and here are some more of our favourite shows. We kick off with an exhilarating show. This was a rhino capture. We headed out with the Kenya Wildlife Service and we darted and then translocated a rhino. It was a hugely dramatic experience, really full of tension and drama because we put a huge rhino down. A lot of activity took place, which you'll see in just a moment. And then eventually that rhino was moved from one location to another for a particular reason. It was so exciting for the entire team. Have a look. What you've just witnessed is a rhino being darted by KWS officials and also uh, experts here at the Opajeta uh, Conservancy. The way that all these men ran to it, that is as fast as poachers come and knock down these rhinos. But what this exercise is, is a notching exercise. It is a way to, in fact, protect these rhinos. We'll find out more about it in just a moment. This really is a very critical exercise that's going on. As you can see, water is being poured. Let's just watch a bit of the action before we explain what's happening. What? 41.53. Samuel, this is a crucial exercise. Take us through what's happening right now behind us. Yeah, as you said rightly, this is a notching exercise. Uh, this is an animal that is about six years old. Uh, it's a white rhino. Uh, the idea is actually to put this animal down and in, make cuts on the ears that would identify this particular animal uniquely. And therefore, we do that in the shortest time possible. Uh, so that um, we release the animal without endangering it. What's happening with this drill? Yeah, the, they are going to be drilling and are going to also um, make incisions elsewhere and, and, and actually put in some security gadget that will enable us to track this animal uh, just to prevent and to ensure that it remains safe and secure. That is actually a notch. Um, every every year as a, as a as special cuts that should add up to the ID number of that particular animal. Um, so this particular animal will uh, be rhino number 153. Okay. Uh, and so the notch pattern will actually be 153. Why is it so important that this exercise happens with incredible speed? Because the um, animal has been tranquilized and that medicine essentially goes to its brain to sort of shut it down, yes. right? 
Yeah. Uh, in in principle, you know, you don't want you don't want to have the animal down for so long. Okay. Because the more you have the animal down, right. The, you you know you send you tend to expose it more and more. Okay. But actually, that drug has to be reversed. So I'm actually now much closer to this rhino and. This is the rhino's horn. Remember, the whole point of this exercise is to protect these rhinos from poachers. What poachers are after is this incredible horn, which is just made out of keratin, the same thing as your fingernails. It, is, it has no medicinal value whatsoever. But the poachers kill rhinos just to get their hands on this horn. So remember, this exercise... Okay. This exercise is to protect the rhino. A transmitter has been drilled into its horn so that it can be tracked. And its ear has also been notched. At the moment, it's uh, it's conscious. It, it can it can sort of uh, hear us. It is it's all right. It is safe. You uh, you can hardly lose this animal at this state now. To think that all this effort has to be made to a, yeah. you know, um, ensure it doesn't sort of in breed which which is one thing but b to to protect its lives from poachers who really are devastating the rhino population across the world i mean w watching this it really is shocking and almost heartbreaking and there it goes though yeah. being translocated let's witness the release um you suggest that i get yeah, up yeah, there got, just get up there okay you stay with the sergeant uh, all right. Tainui okay. And, uh, Derito, okay. The Great. assistant warden capture. Okay. Then we list them. All right. I'm pretty close to the screen, but what's down we're here is really is this rhino. We're just getting ready for the release. Of course, the locks are being uh, unlocked right now. Everyone around us is pretty quiet because we have to let this rhino, of course, settle down a bit. As you can see, there is a bit of confusion. It's getting familiar with its new surrounding. Now it's in the wild. Of course, the bushes and all that is pretty much the same with its previous environment. But the difference is that this area is not fenced and the drugs are wearing off. You can see that there's still marks and blood on this rhino's face, but that eventually will disappear. And there it goes off into the wild. Our hearts really were beating during that entire rhino capture. And I'm sure that rhino went through its flurry of emotions as well, but it is now, of course, a safe and a sound. Well, from that rhino capture to a really fun Mara safari. Loads of you actually loved this show because you said that you felt as if you were on safari with us. We went to the Maasai Mara and we met up with Jackson Lucea, a professional tour guide, and he took us on a safari in the Maasai Mara, which of course is one of the most magical places in the world. We were so lucky to see lions. We didn't quite see the leopard but spent ages looking for it and really the Maasai Mara is the place to be if you've never been well have a look at this show because it certainly will give you a hint of what to expect here's Jackson and 
these two incredible lions. Jackson, hi. Hi. It's How are you doing? I'm very well. Tonight. Good. It is such a beautiful morning here in the Mara and I see we've got a male lion and a female a lioness. Tell us, who are they? This male lion here is Lipstick. He is the dominant male within the Topi Plains uh, pride. And this lioness here looks like she's on hit. That's why the male lion is following her. They separated from the marsh, uh, from the rest of the pride, which the pride is somewhere out in the plains. Okay. And uh, when the lions are on that business, they separate. Right. It's bedroom <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so it's it's private time for the lion and lioness. And how often do they mate? How often? Uh, for how long will they keep away from the pride? This couple will stay away for three days, away from the pride depending how successful he would be when he's mating with this female when she has achieved then the game is over and then they go back to the pride All then right. after three months after this mating we will have new cubs oh wow that's amazing so the gestation period is three months for yeah it's lion. very short three months and reason is lions are not like the other species the other species have a lot of predators, a lot of competition in life. And the lions are the king of the jungle. All right, so we've actually been waiting, looking for about 40 minutes for this leopard. And on my end, really no luck, unfortunately. And now I see Jackson's driving in and I'm guessing he hasn't seen a leopard either. Remember, he went round this thicket uh, because if he had, surely he would have told me by now. <laughs> Hi, Jackson. Hello, Sebastian. All right, so unfortunately, uh, no luck. He's inside here. We, we know when we came, we saw people looking at it and he went walking straight into that thick bush. This is the hour that leopards will rest. Yeah, it is we, really, really hot right yeah, now, Yeah, it's really it? hot and I, it's about nearly 10, 10.30 yeah. and it's the time that leopards will go back to the bush and, and rest. People come on safari many times without seeing a leopard and uh, you could be very lucky and come within minutes and you'll see one. It uh, really is teamwork here, as you can see. I'm doing the rocks, Samuel's gotten started on the wheel, and Jackson is getting some more rocks too. Yeah, we have to secure it, because when you jack the car, it will roll backwards. Okay, come over. Right. No, step on there. With, the with my foot? With your foot. All right. Okay. You don't think my hands are strong enough? Oh, no. Oh, uh, boy. You see? My whole weight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, that's why. You need. Awesome. You can do that if I can't. Okay. Uh, Alrighty. Yeah. Okay. So if you are two ladies, let's say out there, yeah. and and then you see, how can we help one another? <laughs> yeah. So one will put there, and you put your foot there, okay. and you lift with the other leg, uh -huh. and push oh, it down. Okay. So right. put the weight down. Okay. So it's important to to get to know that. So ladies, if you're going on safari and there's no men, that's how you handle the situation. Right, try clearly, one more. clearly you need to learn how to change a tire. Right. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm ah, there we go. You got it. <laughs> that was all my weight and I won't tell you how much I weigh. <laughs> so now we're safe there. Right, I think I'm gonna be on the lookout for any wildlife while this is going on. I think we're safe on this side. And yeah, the buffalo is still pretty far, so, so far, so good. Guess what we found? A dead baboon. I have absolutely no doubt who killed this baboon. It's that leopard. Really? So we're going to be here until she comes. <laughs> if you go, I'll stay. <laughs> Okay, but Jackson, how can you be so sure that it's the leopard that killed this baboon? What, what if this baboon got into a fight with some of its other troop members? Um, when we arrived, the first thing I saw was the baboons were agitated. Right. So I knew something has upset them, either lions or that leopard. So, Jackson, why then has the leopard left this dead baboon here and not devoured it or taken it up into the tree as they normally do? 
So the story here is, is this. Leopards are cunning. The leopards that kill the baboons are very specialized. So what they do, they get into the, the baboons on the edge, grab it, brain it, break the neck, wow. or, bra or just completely you know, brain the animal. So the animal will die instant. And then it will drop and run. Sooner or later, the trip, as you can see, yeah. will wander off. And the leopard will come back. She knows exactly what happened. She will come back and pick it up. We actually saw a baby baboon and probably the daddy baboon come and look at this pregnant, dead mummy baboon. It was really, really moving, Jackson. Um, quite heartbreaking, to be honest, because that's a, a child that's lost, lost its mum. Is, is this characteristic of baboons to behave this way? Um, I have never witnessed myself this uh, type of behavior from the baboon's point of view. Um, I would su suggest or uh, think this baboon, which has been killed by the leopard, is one of the baboons on the hierarchy. It could be at the very top of the hierarchy. And now the, the male baboon came to have a look, to check and to prove that she's no longer there. And of course, he was with the baby, you know, he took the little uh, runt, was, was behind the father. Yeah. And the father came first and then look at it and the baby came and have a look at it. And none of the baboons left. They're, in fact, they're still on view of this, the body of the dead baboon. Why haven't they moved further? Yeah, I, I would think this is a, a very much of a lead of a, of a baboon. Um, this is a mother baboon. And I think they mourn more than they would probably mourn for a male baboon. Really? So you see the way they're mourning. They're sat there. They are waiting. And they don't want to leave. Yeah. And, you know, like elephants. If you think of elephants, if they lose a matriarch, mm. they will have a, a small confusion yeah. to begin with. This is one of those uh, confusion that this troop of baboon, as we witness today, has got to. Because normally baboons will have just graze on and continue to go back to the bushes and, uh, and forget about what happened. This, they have not forgotten. They're still here, they're waiting. The baby's still standing on the logs, waiting to see if the mother possibly will come up. Yeah. No, it was a, quite a heartbreaking to see that little baby it certainly touch was. the mother. And no doubt, we as human beings can can relate. I mean, who would have thought that also baboons um, behave in the same way? They were mourning this dead baboon. So when you go on safari, expect anything from beautiful scenery to magical animals to even having a puncture like we did. It really is teamwork and a lot of fun. But not all our shows have highlighted fun and games on NTV Wild Talk. This next episode is a particular favorite for an important reason. We headed to the Sweetwater's Chimpanzee Sanctuary in Olpegeta. Now, it is a haven for rescued and rehabilitated chimpanzees. Some amazing facts is that chimpanzees share 98% of their DNA with human beings, and that really is a close relation. But what touched me most about this episode is that these chimpanzees have come from truly troubled backgrounds. They have been abused, kept in cages, used in circuses, and now they are being rehabilitated. But it really does take them a long time to get back to normal. And it really goes to show that animal abuse is still so widespread across the world. And it's really an issue that has to be tackled and has to come to an end. Have a look. Who are these guys? We have, with we have Poco, we have uh, Oscar here. Gosh, I gotta say, I mean, this is this is pretty incredible getting so up close to these chimpanzees. But just remember, as much as they may look like they're just sort of relaxing, or some of them may look a little bit down, but. Um, Certainly, this is a much better environment than where they were before. This environment is as close as possible to their natural environment. If you look at these trees, yeah. you, you see the trees, you see the, the shade. There are some trees here that are a little bit as, as tall 
as the trees in the tropical forests. And that enables them to jump onto the branches, break it, and also walk on the ground and hide in the bushes and play around and have that natural enrichment that they will otherwise also have in, the, in, the, in, the, in their natural setup. Talk me through a bit about what, uh, what these guys do on, on a daily basis. We house our chimpanzees inside the houses at night. Okay. But then during the day, we have them outside in the 250 acre mm -hmm. piece of enclosure for them to freely roam around and express natural behavior. So they have breakfast in the morning, they have lunch and they have dinner. During, in between the day, they are allowed to play around with, with the enrichment yeah. structures that we have provided that we have provided in terms of this food enrichment, we have structural enrichment, we have behavioral enrichment, and we also provide uh, destructible enrichment whereby we provide objects that they can manipulate and play around with. Mm -hmm. As a veterinarian, I work very closely with Kenya Wildlife Service veterinarians mm -hmm. to manage the veterinary aspects of these animals. And how challenging is that because whilst they physically may look okay, mentally they're in a, a very different state. The sanctuary has provided a, a home mm -hmm. that has gradually uh, revamped their mental state. Gosh, yeah. I mean it, it is amazing to think that these guys went through literally hell and they've come back and they've made it thanks to this sanctuary here in Alpedita. <laughs> But what I've noticed is the way in which they're being fed is, um, is, very, is very structured and very yeah, yeah, careful. Yeah, yeah, Take yeah. us through that a little bit. Well, mostly with chimpanzees, because there's a hierarchy, um, it is very important that most of the time when you're feeding them, to follow that hierarchy and most of the time you start from the high ranking ones really? you know feed the high ranking ones and as you go towards the low ranking ones and this is uh, to avoid uh, cases whereby the high ranking ones will take food away from the low ranking ones which you may have fed before the high ranking ones oh, and the problem is also, is also that there is a lot of aggression if the high ranking ones feels that the low ranking ones have been fed before them they'll be aggressive towards them. So that is some of the cases where So, we so out of the lot here, who's the boss? Who wants well, to be fed the, the, first? The, the, the alpha male here is Ali Kaka. There he sits, yeah? All right, there. Yeah, Eating there he sits. Banana. He hasn't been the alpha male for long. Oh, wow. And he, ha he has fought for this position almost for two years now. You're standing behind a very interesting item. What is this? This is a cage that uh, Poco, who's a chimpanzee that I believe you saw earlier standing upright, the reason he stands upright most of the time and can actually walk and run upright right. is because he spent nine years in this cage in Burundi, hanging from the ceiling in an automobile garage. Oh my goodness, this is what we heard earlier and this is that cage that, that Poco was in. I mean, it is incredibly small and, mm -hmm. and now you understand why he, he stands on his two legs because there's no space for him to sit. Right. In fact, when he arrived at Old Pegeta, the muscles around his pelvis and his legs were so atrophied that he couldn't even walk like normal chimpanzees. You know, they walk on their knuckles yeah. on all fours. So it took a couple of years for his muscles to come into shape and for him to learn how to walk like a normal chimpanzee. But because he spent nine years here, he still runs around and walks uh, upright. You know, Dan, just having a look at this, it really is heartbreaking to think that any creature could spend nine years of its life um, in, in a, a cage like this. Talk to us more about the illegal trade in chimpanzees. On a, on a bigger scale, how big and bad is this trade? The scale is, is actually quite big. There are probably two to three hundred chimpanzees that leave Africa every year to go outside of Africa to other places. There are probably even many more than that that are kept captive inside Africa, in villages, uh, in marketplaces, as pets for various people inside Africa. And one thing that people have to understand is that for every baby chimpanzee that goes into captivity, up to 10 chimpanzees have been killed to capture that one chimpanzee. Really? Right. So when we, in 2013, the United Nations uh, sponsored a big study to 
try to estimate how many great apes were actually killed connected with the trade. Mm -hmm. It's estimated that up to 3,000 uh, great apes of all types are lost every year, My which is a significant proportion of the overall population of great apes. That, that really is a, a startling number. It is huge. But Dan, why is there a trade in, in apes, in chimpanzees and, and all the rest? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's because when chimpanzees and orangutans, gorillas, bonobos, all of them, when they're young, they're so cute and cuddly yeah. and fun, people want them as pets. And so they are captured, they're, they're sent off to the Middle East, they're sent off to Russia and all the other so former Soviet Union countries. Right. They're sent to the Far East. In the Far East, they're mainly used in entertainment, in oh, zoos and safari parks. Me. So the babies, they start out as what we call photo props. Yeah. They're cute little babies. They dress them up in baby clothes. Visitors come into the zoo or safari park, and then people pay to have their photograph taken with the little baby, and they pay. So th this is why these zoos want them, because they, they make money from them. When they get a little bit older, they go into the entertainment business. They train them to perform. They can be in bands playing musical instruments. They'll go into boxing matches. Oh my goodness. They'll go into all, uh, they'll, ride, they'll ride bicycles, unicycles, so, they'll play drums, they'll do all <sighs> kinds of different things. People come in in their hundreds and thousands to pay money to watch these great apes perform. Are we on the right track to, to beating this? I think now we are, if everyone works together. That's the key to it. It's very, very difficult to get all the different organizations to actually work together. You know, there's certain jealousies, or you know, yeah. there's certain conflicts between different groups who are all trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And what's really important is just getting everyone, everyone on the same page to work together with the same objective. If you've never been to the chimpanzee sanctuary at the Sweetwaters, then do make it a point to go and visit. Those chimps really do need all the love they can get. All right, it is now time for a breather on NTV Wild Talk. Remember, we are bringing you some of the best episodes in 2016. If you've never seen any of them, remember that you can log on to our NTV Wild YouTube channel. All the episodes are there. The links are also on our NTV Wild Facebook page. And hey, why not join in the conversation? Tell us what you think by tweeting using the hashtag NTV Wild. Stay with us much more when we return. Welcome back to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. We are bringing you some of the best NTV Wild Talk shows that we filmed in 2016. Now we take you to Amboseli, where it really was a magical experience as we got up close to herds and herds of huge and amazing elephants. So many of you actually loved this show too because you couldn't believe how incredible elephants really are and we learned all about them through two amazing women who have dedicated their lives to studying and researching elephants. Did you know, for example, that elephants mourn their dead, they celebrate their young and they are such affectionate animals. There really is a special connection, but elephants are being poached across the country and across the continent, so they really must be protected. Let's take you to Amboseli.
Here we have Anne, we have Amelia, we have Anne Harred, and we have um, Alfie. So uh, it's not all the member of the family is here. We have the matriarch of AA's family. The leader of AA family is Amelia. She is there in front of there, leading the family. As you can see them, they are just eating slowly, heading to the swamp. And I'm where they are talking to the, the member of the family. Really? Yeah, they do calling them, you know where we are, we are here. Oh, wow. And Amelia, as the leader, is the one who's just uh, telling everybody what's happening. Oh, wow, that really is amazing. They are communicating. Mm -hmm. uh, Katito, do elephants often spend time in family circles? Because uh, as Nora said, this is one family unit. Yeah, they do spend time all together, especially the females. Because when a male reach 14 to 15 years, he leave the family and join a bachelor group of males. <laughs> uh, some, that's why you see one male by himself or two male by themselves. Right. But families, sisters, cousin, aunt, they stay together until the rest of their life. That motherly love really, really is something. And we can actually see in the distance that there is a little baby yeah, there just, <laughs> as well. Oh, yeah, resting, <laughs> resting in the bushes. The calf is lying down. Yeah. They, they don't have they to wake move. the calf. They yeah. have to wait for the calf to. Yeah. When the red is ready, the calf <laughs> to move. And also, wow. a, a young calf like this, when the mother give birth, yeah. there's this what we call a low mothers. Mm -hmm. They take care of the calf. And what the calf, the calf do, just go and suckle to the mother yeah. and back. Like what we normally say, we hire house girl to take care of the baby yes. when you go to work. Yes. They have to wait for the calf. But if they really want to go, what they do, they just go and touch the baby a little bit. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Wake up, please. <laughs> and, and sometimes what they do, they kick. No, I don't okay. want. And you see, really? like, just do that. Like the calf, the, the human baby calf yeah. doesn't want to get up. Oh. Just do like this. So Mom, even see that, <laughs> just put their trunk like this. Oh. Yeah, so that's they don't. just like any human being. I mean, a mother wouldn't wake up her baby from its No, no, no. Slumber. Yeah, just yeah, yeah wait, wait to enough, sleep. Enough rest. Yeah. And how yeah. old is that little baby? Do you think? Uh, three months. Three months. And it's how three can months. You, how can you tell that? The ears are pinkish, so you can say that is like um, less than a week. Oh. And also, you know, they have umbilical cord. Like a human oh, being, yes. baby, uh, the umbilical cord go yeah. away after seven days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, you look how if the calf is still wobbly you can estimate the, the age. But tell us more about, really, how intelligent these guys are. Somewhere they're being poached. They can remember that their enemies is human being by shooting them, using the car, using the gun. So like, that's why in Amboseli they don't know about being poached. So other parts, like in Savo, when approaching an elephant, you approach an elephant, is to take, take, it will just take off. You know, now I can see the Elephants are entering into the swamp mm -hmm. and it's beautiful to watch. How is the baby going to manage? Because I'm a little concerned. Yeah, well, okay, the, the calf will follow the mother mm -hmm. and will be just swimming. Because really? Now, yeah, because mm -hmm. the, this swamp is so deep. So they go to the marsh and, and uh, the mother will be just feeding the marsh and the calf will be there behind the mother and the mother will be making sure with the tail. The oh. cover is there. Oh the wow! The is and what is the the lifespan of of an elephant? Uh, Sixty-five to seventy. So again, you know, similar to human beings. Yeah. And by the way, elephants they do die because of the teeth. They have the last set of the teeth, and they die because of sufficient because yeah. they don't eat everything when they have the last set of the teeth. So if elephants they do have dentists, mm. they could live longer. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Katito. When you hear about incidents of poaching around the country, perhaps not in Amboseli, how does it make you feel? I feel terrible. Yeah. Sometimes even uh, you see like you find, uh, you, f you, f you see something like that over here, you feel like, why do you have to, why do they have to kill? Just because of ivory? And in Amboseli is, is, is much better because when uh, an elephant we, because we do, we, we do the census every day, right. so we know everybody is make sure everybody is, is there, here. is here. So if we do a census, because we do a census every day, if I miss one of the members of the family, as I say, female sisters, cousin, and they stay together mm -hmm. until the rest of their life. If I miss a day, maybe she was in stress because sometimes they go in stress and but they have to come back in the later because right. sometimes the male chase them away. 
uh, and then we have to report and just say for Keda Bliss, we are missing this female. Like okay. we had a female who was called Jemima. She was my favorite from the JB's family. Yeah. Uh, she had an albino. Oh, okay. And we had three mm. albino. Really? Very interesting. And both of them, they were males. Mm -hmm. And that female, all the time she was with the family, all the time she was called Jemima. And then I did the census. Second day, three days, oh no, she's not there. I had to report. And so she was poisoned. <gasps> she was poisoned. Uh, but lucky they would poison her they were trying to attack her but she got poisoned to take the task but lucky i reported immediately to kws and kws they say do you know because as we know where the home ranges for the elephant mm. i said that elephant come from uh mm, east side yeah so you can get you know the, where mm -hmm. we can get and then they went they found her and dead and so sad two calves were there gosh a uh, young one the albino one was just there and lucky they took the task so it is so sad when you feel like somebody try to spear an elephant mm. or put the elephant to take ivory yeah. yeah yeah and also it's so good because you know when an elephant broke its task imagine grow again mm. yeah so they continue to grow slowly by slowly yeah yeah so i feel like no that is not not good sometimes you see like i found an elephant die i tear i cry mm. and people think like this woman <laughs> are you sure are you, are you crying for a human being? Yeah. Like, yeah, it is like you it is like for me I lost a member of my family. Mm. I feel the same thing I feel to these elephants. Yeah. yeah. Nora, what are some of your fondest memories in the last thirty years uh, that you've that you've worked? What are some of the, the crazy experiences that you've had with these elephants? And in fact I had one boyfriend, Ian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he was killed in Tanzania by right now. Oh in, no. Uh, in nineteen ninety four. They went in Tanzania and there was a hunting block in oh the Megiddo area. And we lost nine males, big over 50 years. Really? So when I joined the project, my favorite, all, all of us, we have favorite elephants. So my favorite elephants, when I joined the elephants, uh, the project was Ian. Oh. And by the way, I named him after my son. Oh, I how nice. So in love with him. Oh, and wow. Was, so Ian was so, <laughs> I don't know what to say, he was so good at behaving like mass male aggressive just uh, fighting with other males and you know even when they're in mass they have walking style yes <laughs> so Ian was having all this be behavior right so anyway i was so sad when he was killed in tanzania yeah. clearly you still love yeah, ian and you still yeah. love jemima and and all oh, the rest yeah. as well yeah. all right ladies thank you so much so as a nation and as the world, we really need to take strict action against poaching to protect elephant populations and to ensure that they thrive because really elephants play a key role on this planet and it is unimaginable to think about what this world would be like without them. Well, let's move on to the next show now. And this one really, really was a fun one that made a lot of people laugh. But before it made me laugh, it made me panic. It was about vultures. Now, I've got to admit that I am pretty afraid of big birds and wild birds. So when I was told that we've got to do this episode on vultures, I wasn't so easy. But I learned a lot getting up close to some of these animals really does make you have a new appreciation for them. Now many people look at vultures as I did as not very attractive animals who perhaps uh, don't have much of a big role on this planet but in fact they do. They clean up all the carcasses and all the mess in places like the Maasai Mara, the Serengeti and everywhere really. And so they really, really play an important role. And why was this episode that much more fun and that much more interesting? Well, um, there was a bit of drama surrounding the vulture on an operating table and I was involved in a little bit of drama too with a vulture. Have a look at this. This is a fish eagle. How did she end up here? Well, apparently she was stolen from her nest and sold to a hotel who kept her in a tiny little cage. Um, and a, a lot of tourists complained about this to the KWS, so they went in and rescued her and brought her. 
<laughs> and brought her here. Why, why is she making all the noise? What is the call for? Is she uncomfortable that perhaps she's now in, in a cage, although it's bigger than what it was before? No, this is all to do with territory. She is in the territory of a pair that are nesting in the tree above me, and they don't approve of having her here. <laughs> So they're shouting at her and she's shouting insults back. Okay. You know, she is so beautiful. When you get this close to a bird of prey, you really re realise um, how big they are and how fabulous they are. But will Boringo ever, ever be released back into the wild? Very sadly, she won't because somewhere down the line, she's badly broken her wing and nobody did anything about it. Oh, wow. Had somebody known and brought her to us, we could have repaired that wing, but it's been broken for too long <coughs> and it's set all wrong, so she'll never be able to fly properly. Because a bird of prey has to be in perfect condition to be able to catch its dinner. Really? Otherwise yeah. they would starve to Otherwise death? Otherwise she, she would starve to death. She has to stay here, sadly. Um, this is a black sparrow hawk. Unfortunately, kids chucked rocks at her. Oh. Bro broke her legs so badly that it was unsavable. And so she now has a false leg. Really? But unfortunately, the false leg does come off every so often, so we can't <laughs> release her. Right. But she does very well on that false leg. So why, why are you rescuing and rehabilitating these birds? If one doesn't, they get injured, they get poisoned, whatever, and they die full stop so and so many of them are becoming endangered so we are rescuing people bring stuff in the KWS bring birds to us uh, people ring us up and say help I found a bird somewhere what do I do about it they come in we try and repair them if we possibly can and we release them back in the wild. How important are these birds of prey that you have here? Some are eagles, some are vultures, but you have other birds as well, such as owls. Why are they important to the ecosystem? Every single one has a role to play. The owls, for instance, although they work at night totally silently and there's a lot of superstition against them, they are hunting your mice, your rats, your vermin. Yeah. And without them, the vermin would overtake the, the whole country. Yeah. So they're very, very important. And it's so sad that people keep murdering them because of superstition. Uh, well, this particular species is now critically endangered. Um, along with the white back vulture, they're also critically endangered, and we'll see that later. So the whole... <laughs> <laughs> Come back here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Use your glove. All right, I'm not. <laughs> okay, I need that, that to calm down. <laughs> Gollum was um, pecking at me. <laughs> um, misbehaving, Gollum. <laughs> but I suppose I'm a stranger. All right, I, I'll calm down a little bit. So these birds of prey are under threat for various different reasons. And poisoning, as you say, is one of the bigger reasons. Let's talk about that. Poisoning is absolutely catastrophic when it happens. We've got some video that was taken in April 2005 at uh, game ranching in Athi River, which was actually a protected area at the time. And a cow was laced with carboforan, a pesticide commonly used for killing wildlife. And it killed 187 vultures, really? which represented a fair proportion of the entire you know, sub-region's population. So that was a massive loss, and it took about 10 days for anything to recover to see a single other vulture in the sky. But that area there probably had a number of other poisoning incidents. We knew that two weeks later, um, another poisoning happened there. And exactly April 2006, a year later, a very big poisoning event happened. So one of the problems that we have is not really being able to prosecute. It's very difficult to find people who poison. It's silent, it's quiet. Uh, the impact is it's, it's, it's absolutely awful to watch. You see just hundreds of dead birds. Um, we've got pictures of them being thrown in the back of a yeah, tractor. Yeah. Uh, it's very moving to see it and utterly pointless. In the rest of the world, vultures are considered you know, to be very useful and such a thing is a terrible crime. So we need to make that uh, very clear. Uh, we've been working for over 10 years to try to make that a priority for the conservation of vultures in Africa. Here is Gizmo who has now been sedated and Simon is about to fix on that transmitter. 
Darcy, can you take us through what Simon's doing? Simon is, is fixing, this is going to be the transmitter. It goes on the vulture's back, just like a backpack. So it's going to have two straps coming below, above and two below, and then it, it fixes right here on the chest of the bird. So this is what it looks like. It's very light. Um, it's you know smaller than a cell phone, mm -hmm. and it uses the GSM network. So generally up northern Kenya, it'll be transmitting once a day on Safaricom. So it's picking oh. up GPS um, location points about once every 15 minutes. Wow. So we really will know every place this bird goes. And oh. we, we need to know that because, you know, if they disappear, this is the only way we can find them. Let's put him into the, into the box ready for transportation. Sarah Gizmo has set off on his journey. How does this make you feel? Because you have rehabilitated him and spent a good time with him. What does this mean for you? Well, first of all, it's he's going home. So I'm chuffed a bit that he's going home. But I will have to admit, there's, there's always that little worry. Have we got it right? Is he strong enough? You can't help but worry. It's you do when you release a child and send it to school same sort of thing we've seen how much love and affection you darcy simon and martin and the whole team have for these birds of prey here how important is it that kenyans fall in love with these birds of prey as well i think it's very important we've got too much superstition against these birds and yet they are vital to us we need to learn just how useful they are to us, because they really are. And without them, we, the human race, would suffer. And that Vulture episode brings us to the end of our NTV Wild Talk Best of 2016 Part 2. We certainly hope that you've had a blast through 2016, because we certainly have. And we really are looking forward to many more episodes this year in 2016. In case you missed any of the shows, you can always find them on our NTV Wild YouTube channel. We also have our links up on our NTV Wild Facebook page and you can always find us on Twitter using the hashtag NTV Wild. It really has been a pleasure and from the entire NTV Wild crew here at NTV, also at Wildlife Direct and at KWS, we certainly do wish you all the best and a very happy new year. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. We'll see you again next Tuesday at 10 p.m. So the whole <laughs> come back here. NTV Wild Talk, in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct.